Welcome to Conversations. Today I'm going to talk about the fact that I'm alcoholic, and I'm going to talk about that in terms of a binge that I just went on recently. Um, perhaps, if this sort of thing bothers you, I may be talking about some bodily functions, and for me it's easier to talk about those with their common names rather than to try to find euphemisms around them. So if that bothers you, don't watch. Otherwise, uh, to help me do this today, I have as my guest Liz Rance, who is the doctor at local jail. Welcome, Liz. I'm Thank awfully you. glad that you joined me for this. I can't think of anyone I'd rather have Thank you. Uh, for any number of reasons. Let's, let's start with the kind of drunk I am which is long-term, 50-some years old, drunk all my life. Uh, I've got to the point now where I can go two years, I can go a year and a half, I can go six months, three months, and not ever have a real desire. And then out of nowhere, for some reason, boom, I drink. And when I start, I drink endless fifths of, of whatever is there. I'll clear out... Uh, my local bar of my favorite brand and move on to the next brand there. I do nothing else. I isolate sort of, except I'm a semi-public figure or see myself that way, so I don't lock my door and people come and go and <laughs> they check up on me to see how I'm doing. Uh, those who have more experience wait until I'm done drinking. Those who have less experience try to get me to a hospital and move to a bottle, which is, I don't think, the greatest idea, but uh, let's skip right to what could kill me, Re reflections on the type of, you know, what this sort of end game, <clears throat> when livers explode and things like that, what, what could happen? Well, a lot of things could happen to you. Long term, drinking like that has damaged your liver. And if you keep doing it, your liver will get worse. And eventually you could go into liver failure. Um, a lot of alcoholics, uh, alcoholic cirrhosis, will develop uh, bleeding from their stomach. They can vomit and throw up enough blood to bleed out. They die in the emergency room that way. Um, if you get pancreatitis, uh, you can get extremely sick and, in fact, can end up being diabetic. Um, could you explain that to me? My doctor, that's the biggest thing he worries about. Yeah about is that, you know, I'm not diabetic. How do I become diabetic overnight? Well, the pancreas has a number of functions, and one of them is to make insulin. And if you wipe out your pancreas, you won't make any more insulin. And you become diabetic? Yeah. Just like that? Yeah. And that's it's pretty unusual. Uh, oh. it, it generally, uh, so you might have a, an acute episode, and you need to be in the hospital and have your glucose monitored and things. But generally, to, to completely wipe out a pancreas is hard to do. I, I work hard at it. Uh, yeah, it sounds like you work hard at it. Um, as I say, I, for some reason, that's once I start, that is it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't, when I start, I don't think that's where mm -hmm. I'm going. Um, let's lead into that thing of, of what sets it off, not because I want to get into my personal history, but Part of the reason I want to do this is for other people, perhaps, to have an insight into <coughs> if they have a, a relative or something. <coughs> and what sets you off is, is the question that if you were in long-term intensive therapy with someone, they'd be trying to help you right. find. And also, we were going to do something, then let's get sidetracked. You and I should make some disclaimers before we do this show. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about why I do it, and we should both talk about what our limitations okay. and strengths are. Would you like to go first? Or? Go ahead. I do not represent any alcoholic organization. Uh, I belong to one, but I am in no way, shape, or form representing them or their views. I've had a therapist who's helped me with these issues, uh, the fact that I still drink is not his fault. 
Uh, I am today speaking only for myself, except that we're going to talk about some of the care issues involved here in Missoula County and using my story as a reflection of, of some of those issues. So in that sense, I'm speaking for other people that these things happen to, but I do not speak for anyone but myself. How about you? Well, I am a general practitioner. I've been working for the county jail here for 10 years now. Um, before, well, all of my professional career, I've worked with uh, poor people and uh, often homeless people, and that, of course, often involves substance abuse problems. A few years ago, I got very interested in addiction and uh, attended a number of, of educational programs on it, but I'm, I'm not a specialist. I'm not certified in it or anything like that. There is, in fact, one, only one physician in Missoula, as far as I know, who is a certified addiction specialist. Um, I don't do hospital care of patients, so uh, what I know about the hospitalization of acute uh, alcoholic problems goes back more years than I'd like to tell you. Okay. You do not also speak for the Missoula Health System? Oh, absolutely not. I you work in the jail. I'm the maverick here. Yeah. Okay. That was one of the reasons that I was yeah. thrilled to have you. <clears throat> also, I get ahead of myself. One of the things I also wanted to do was talk just a bit about my motivations for doing this. Because I know that those are going to come up along the line at some point. Already, I talked to my friend Jenny Miriam, who's the health editor at the Missouri, and wants to do a full page on this. That was not my intention. I just told her we were going to do this show. But it's going to look like I'm out to <coughs> grandstand. First of all, I want to say I am. This is a television show that I've put a lot of time, effort into. I'm doing the show because I want to help other people, but I am not unaware that this is hopefully going to be a show that makes some difference and increases my visibility in the community. I can't be unaware of that. Unfortunately, a person can, at least maybe some people can, and I can't be totally altruistic. Um, also, I may be accused of trying to work out my own problems and my own therapy by using my TV show. I'm not unaware of that at all either. Uh, I have found that being open about being gay, that being open about being HIV positive have helped me deal with both of those issues. And perhaps by doing this show and letting it all hang out in this way, it can improve my chance of sobriety. I am not in any sense using this as a substitute for other things to help me out. In fact, I'm doing more, I hope, right now along those lines outside of this show than I've ever done. Now, those are the, the that's kind of selfish ones. Let's move up to the more altruistic. All of you out there are touched by alcohol, I would say. You have relatives, friends, you don't know how to deal with them, and I'm going to try to not tell you how to deal with them, but maybe give you some insight into what it's like to be inside them and the kind of care that they are likely to receive. Um, and then the big thing, I would like to make a pitch with this show that in some way we find a way to better coordinate the efforts in the community. I do not in any way want to say that any system or institution in the valley is deficient is not doing the job as they understand it. My point, and the point I think that Liz will make is that it isn't working as well as it could, or even I think as well as it did in the days when I went to Galen and took care of them. There. That's quite a good place. So before I get into the binge, anyway, anything we can throw in there from you? No. Could you talk about, uh, before I talk about my personal experience, mm -hmm. let's talk about the jail system. I. I spent one night in jail because I was out naked throwing rocks mm -hmm. at my house. Uh, there was nobody on the block, so I wasn't disturbing anyone's peace technically, uh, except my boyfriend who was inside the house uh, and called the cops. Um, they took me. I spent one night in jail. I'd never been in jail. I ran into Wally Clark. I said, this is crazy. He said, 
you know, be good for 30 days if I'm going to record. Now, that's <laughs> my experience with, with being mm -hmm. in jail. Um, I don't think that I've avoided jail because I'm a good person. I think I've avoided jail because I use the hospital. Would you talk to us about some of the jail population? What happens there? Some of those people who are... <coughs> well, there's no question that substance abuse contributes to the incarceration of a lot of people. Um, and we have the full range. We have a lot of people like you're describing who are brought in basically because there's nothing, <clears throat> nothing else to do with them. Uh, they are too drunk, too obnoxious for some reason to be just sent home. Um, and there's no place else for them to go. They haven't usually done that much in terms of breaking laws. Uh, just kind of public nuisance thing. Uh, and in fact, most people who are brought in because they're public nuisances are, are booked and released. We're, we're not in the business of short-term incarceration for minor offenses. Um, and then we have a number of people who are brought in for specific substance abuse-related problems, uh, drugs and alcohol. Uh, the most <coughs> predominant one, of course, is the DWI, the driving under the influence people. And uh, there are very strict laws in Montana, as elsewhere in the country now, uh, about drinking and driving. There should be. If, if I had my way, you wouldn't drive if you had had a drink at all. Um, but we have this system that incarcerates people when they've been drinking and driving. And if you do it twice, you're in longer. And if you're in three times, you do it, I think it's when you get to four times, you're in for a year. Um, you <coughs> may be in the county jail for a year, working off your DWA. Um, and then we have people who are in on criminal offenses that are related to their substance abuse. Uh, they're poor, so they, in order to drink, they have to write bad checks. Or um, they drink and beat their wife and get brought in. And uh, so we have the full spectrum. Um, I always tell people if, if you've got a drinking problem and you need to get detoxed, you want to get arrested because we do it, I think, very well. Um, but then once a person is sober, if they spend a long time in the county jail, they will not get any kind of therapy other than AA. We have a few AA groups that come in and work on. Uh, and I, that person is something that, that I've been personally lobbying to get changed. I think that. Uh, it, it would be much more useful, especially for the, the drunk drivers, if there was some other program. And they attempted in the last legislature to get a diversion program going that would take people, uh, <coughs> not not incarcerate them, but put them in a treatment program. I'm not sure what happened to that. It was going pretty well, but I don't think it actually mm -hmm. passed in the end. But it will. I mean, soon will. I mean, that's the trend across the country now. And we follow the trend. Okay, well, let's see how quickly or wh how efficiently, let's put it this way, I can go through a rather long experience. We talked about what set me off. Uh, I have been set off by something that was really wonderful. I decided that AIDS was, that we turned the corner one day when uh, the level of the virus in the lymph nodes, uh, we were able to take it down to mm -hmm. undetectable, and I figured AIDS was not going to end in a big gesture, and that this was the one. I was happy. I walked into the Oxford. I thought, I should drink to this. I'd been to my therapist just before that. Uh, I was happy as could be. I was joyous, and that set me off. So. Although this particular time I was worried about, there were stresses of other kinds. I don't think that's, in this case, all that material. Just to say that this happens fast and you don't predict it, the, at least the kind of alcoholic I am. Sometimes you can in hindsight, but sometimes it can just, like that, you walk by a bar and it sounds like it's a good idea. <clears throat> that's what happened this time. Um, as I say, I drank this and stuff. So I started, um, good friend, 
knew that I was going to be drinking. I said I was. I don't remember that, strangely enough. But uh, so he called other friends. Thank God I had them. Um, all this is in hindsight because when this happens, time sort of stands still and what you remember are flashes here, flashes there, sometimes long periods, sometimes not at all. Um, I started two days later. My friend Brant showed up. Uh, I was in the middle of a bottle. He insisted I should go. He gave me two choices. Either I went on my own or he called and they were going to take me. Um, there were a bottle of tranquilizers nearby that was empty. As it turned out, they were empty because I'd been out, but he didn't know that. So he gave me that choice. I wound up going. The ambulance comes. The, uh, sometimes the siren's on. The lights are whirling. I can't walk by an ambulance and smell that gasoline smell without having recollections of, of being there. <clears throat> they come in, it's a really strange experience because all of a sudden you are at your most compass, you're comfortable, whatever. There are big, huge guys all around you asking questions. There are speakers, you know, going off. They're going, they're talking to the hospital about who they got, what they got, they're trying to get you out. Um, and they put you in, they take you there. You get into the emergency room, and for some reason that takes forever. They put you there. I've always gotten good care. This time I got a doctor who I felt didn't like me for some reason, but that's the only time I have ever had any feeling. You know, I, I don't feel that my HIV has ever caused any problem where I was treated less well. Being gay has never caused me any problem. Okay, so I'm in the emergency room. It takes forever, and there's no nothing to distract you. And you just sit somewhere. <coughs> now, I at some point I was sent for chest X-rays. Uh, there are blood exams. It goes on and on, or at least this time it seemed to, and it usually does. Um, what I, they're looking for is whether you are sick enough to be admitted. Being drunk is not quite enough, because it turns out in this case, and I don't remember. Grant being there, I don't remember anything I said to him at all. I had this flash, but at one point, I looked down and those little things they put on you in the hospital, I had them on. So I was vaguely aware that I'd been to the hospital, but I didn't know when. I didn't know whether it was recently, whether it was the day before, all of a sudden I come in and gone. Um, somewhere in there, I remember my local bartender, Sean, telling me, Greg, you've had enough. You know, can't see me. I don't remember whether this is going to be the last bottle or whether, whatever, but that's in there somewhere. Um, so I had been kicked out of the hospital um, on my own, walking the streets and not even remembering where I'd been. <clears throat> I drank now for another couple of days, started all over again. This time my friend Joel showed up. And I was through, at the end of a bottle, I was ready to go. I was ready to cooperate. I wanted to go. Again, we called the uh, 911. Same routine. Big guys, lots of noise, out in the ambulance, go to the hospital. This time, I spent three days at the leave. Same routine, though, waiting around, getting admitted. This time they discovered that I've got a little bit of pneumonia and that justifies putting me upstairs in the hospital. Wonderful, wonderful nurses, aides. Uh, strange thing though is they can't give me anything to help me sober up because the doctor downstairs didn't write that somewhere. And so I am, um, okay. If, at the end of this period, they, they get me set up, uh, it's fine, I'm get out. And uh, once before I got out and I have been able to go get two pints, drink that, and then the next day I get up and start my life again and cleaning up. So I think I can do it again. I think that's what happened. I start again. Um, somewhere along in there, I remember thinking, well, I'm going to do 
I'm going to sober up because I did this once by watching movies. So <clears throat> I remember going to Crystal Video, then going to the Fantasy to see if there were any porno tapes. It turns out later, the gal tells me that I walked into Crystal Theater, watched part of the Bergman film, came out and made some intelligent comments on Bergman, but I don't remember that. Um, I thought this was a long time back in my binge, but when I go to return movies, it turns out it was the day before. But last Friday, um, it's, that's it. I just know that I can't drink anymore. I absolutely just, at that point, well, the night before I tried calling Share House, they said maybe they could get me in, but I had to talk to some lady in the morning because they met through the hospital. Uh, I make it through to the time that's allotted. I call. Share House only takes the homeless, and uh, they can do nothing for me. I don't know what I would want for me, except that coming down is the worst part of it. Time is the only thing that can help you, but boy, it's a rough thing. And maybe we should break this there. That's the, the drinking part of it. Mm -hmm. and I thought I was going to talk about sheds and piss and catheters. Believe me, all of that comes in there. It's demeaning, humiliating. One thing I want to stress is that if you're dealing with something like this, you say, how can you do this? The person who is that far gone doesn't realize it's doing that to himself. If you're lying there in a, a pool of vomit, you're in a different space, you don't realize that that well, maybe you do. I don't <coughs> remember being aware of that sort of thing. I have at other times been in situations where people say, if you don't quit right now, there are going to be serious consequences. Believe me, I think most drunks would like to quit right there, or at least at the end of the bottle. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But So let, let's stop at the, that point. Is the hospital the emergency room that I go to? Are they equipped? Are they trained for this? Let's put it that way. Is this the best way to handle it? Let's put it another way. Both of our local hospitals are quite well equipped to deal with the kind of thing you're describing. I mean, deal with a whole lot worse than you're describing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I, I would say that that's probably part of the problem, having been an ER doc for 20 years before I became a jail doc. Um, and the ER functions an awful lot like the jail. That the police or friends will pick somebody up who's drunk and they bring them in because they don't know what else to do with them. And uh, the ER has to make a decision about resource allocation, basically. Is this person, does this person have a medical problem or an addiction problem? And if they have an addiction problem, is it bad enough that something can be done about it? Now, there are problems there. The medical one's easy, as you found out. If you got pneumonia, they can put you in the <coughs> hospital. It, frankly, pneumonia is one of the more common causes because when people are drunk, they pass out and they vomit and they aspirate and they get very sick. And it's a terrible, in fact, one of the leading causes of death of, of alcoholics. But assuming you don't have one of those medical things, mm -hmm. is it a, an emergency room problem? And the answer is no, it's really not. Uh, now, some people who, you're, you're describing binge drinking, which doesn't interest docs a whole lot. If you are a real chronic alcoholic, if you were drinking a fifth a day every day for six months, and then you wander into the ER, you, you know, I, I can convince myself pretty easily that you need to be in the hospital to be detoxed. But binge drinkers, by and large, don't have a whole lot of trouble. Like, as you described, you get sick and you throw up and this. But you get over it. With no medical help, you can get past that if you choose to, mm -hmm. to dry up. The problem is there are a lot of legal problems with getting someone dealt with when they, they come in and mm -hmm. they say, if they come in and they say, I want to stop drinking and I want you to help me, doctor. <clears throat> if, the, if the area has detox facilities, that's easy. You know, the doctor calls them up and says, I've got Greg down here and he's ready to quit drinking again. Will you take him? And we have a shortage of that kind of beds around here. So as you know, I mean, mm -hmm. there's Butte and if you've got enough <coughs> money, there's uh, there are some other resources. But basically, if you're reasonably poor, 
and you just want to quit drinking, there aren't a whole lot of places you can go to do that. Um, if you don't want to quit, if you, you're sitting in the ER and you're cursing at Brant for bringing you in because all you really want to do is go back and have another drink, Finish that bottle. the doc can't do anything. I mean, we, we can't uh, essentially incarcerate you in a hospital to dry you out. Um, that, that's just, we, we fought those civil liberties battles for years. And uh, you know and I know that you're irrational and you don't have a clue what's best for you. But if you say, I don't want to be here, Doc, I'm leaving, I might have you sign a AMA slip saying that you were leaving against my advice, but that's the most I can do. You're out the door. So I, the first time with Brandt, yeah. as it turns out later, I found out by my stool, I guess I will use one of the nice words, <laughs> which was totally black the second time I went in. At first it was horrifying, but then we figured out that they had put charcoal down me the first time around. Because they were concerned about the, the, the drug, the tranquilizers, the tranquilizers. Yeah, which I didn't take, yeah. but uh, yeah. 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 Um, how did they get the charcoal down me? See, I don't remember that. Well, it depends on how cooperative you were. You, you could have drunk it or they could have put a tube down your throat and stuck it in there. It's, uh, and what if, so I don't even remember being there and yet I'm released out on the street. Yeah. Of course, this is my responsibility. I, I, I have no time in denying this, but and we with the civil yeah. liberties, so we yeah. just turn people out. Sure. To if you're not breaking home. the law and you're not really sick, even if you are really sick, I mean, I've had alcoholics who had horrible pneumonia tell me that they were walking out of the ER because they knew they wanted to drink, and they knew if I put them in the hospital, they weren't going to get a drink. Uh, people die that way. Um, well, these are some of the things and issues that we want to bring up. <clears throat> Let's go on and finish the detox part of this in a sense. I, here I am, I've been this down this road before. I know it is incredibly painful, sobering. I don't know whether it's dehydration, but you feel like every cell in your body is hurting and hurting badly. Uh, you can't eat. Or at least I can for well, a good day and a half. So you're fighting that, trying, thinking you should eat, but you can't. There are drugs that could help on that. Right? Mm -hmm. But again, the only thing I could think of is share house. That's not there. Uh, it's like you sit, you do anything, whatever. In my case, you just—it's the hardest thing in the world. And, and to tell the drunk to stop. Because there's something about the drinking itself that once you get going, the only thing that makes it feel better is more alcohol. Is there a biological reason for mm -hmm. that? Or? Yeah. It's biochemical breakdown products, and uh, when <coughs> your, your body gets adjusted to having a certain blood level, it, <coughs> it wants it, and when it gets low, the, the addictive process, same with any, any addictive substance. So you're sitting there, and you know that the only thing that's going to make you feel better, except drugs which are out there somewhere and you don't know how to access, is another drink. Mm -hmm. And you know you have the money, you can go, yeah. you know, right next door, yeah. buy a bottle and start all over again. So it really, to stop is one of the hardest things to do, and it takes an incredible amount mm -hmm. of willpower. Well, one of the questions we ask when you're trying to decide if someone really has an addiction problem is whether when they first get up in the morning they feel a need for that for a drink because most of us can go out and drink a whole lot on Saturday night and get up on Sunday morning and have a glass of tomato juice and keep going well, but alcoholics time. need they, they just <coughs> feel they got to have that beer when they get up or they're not going to be able to start the day well there was a time yeah, when you know a bloody Mary or, or two mm -hmm. might get you going and yeah. that's of course I don't drink like that anymore I thought this was going to be long and horrible and drawn out and embarrassing and strangely enough it hasn't been that bad to talk to you about it <laughs> it takes days mm -hmm. uh, I mean go by stages if you've done it before you know there's the first time you can get something down 
there's uh, got an announcement. I wanted to do this show very soon after, yeah. so I'd be more <laughs> befuddled because it's like anything else, you want to forget yeah. bad memories. But when, uh, when did you last have a drink? Friday, did you say? It was Friday morning, so it mm -hmm. would have been, a week, been a week ago today. You're doing pretty well. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, the last two days, I got my apartment cleaned up again, and the um, only thing I seriously broke was uh, the floor lamp. Lots of people die in, shall we say, mechanical ways. Mm -hmm. William Holden, the, the great yeah. actor, lived alone, <clears throat> and as far as we know, fell, hit his head on a coffee table, and bled to death. Yeah, accidents of various sorts are frequent causes of injury and death and alcohol. Partly because they're out and about. Drug addicts tend to take their drug and sort of stay home and do whatever they do, whereas alcoholics are out in the bars and driving cars. And I become very skillful. I mean, in the sense that the uh, first time I started this thing, the lack of physical control of the whole apartment would fall apart. Mm -hmm. Uh, now I just sort of, uh, there's some sort of, I don't know, it's compass or whether I'm aware at the time, but I take it very slow and measured and I can uh, get by with it. You know, it's a mess, mm -hmm. but it isn't as trashed as it used to be. And as I say, mm -hmm. I don't go very far mm -hmm. away from home. Well, I guess I could go into some very embarrassing details, but that's about covers that mm -hmm. part. But let's talk about <coughs> the shortcomings of the system and what... If, if you don't mind, I'd like right. to talk about one other thing. All right. Because you're describing one kind of substance right. abuse, which is very different from the chronic alcoholic or who drinks some every day for, for years. And... The, the disruption to the family and loses jobs and uh, eventually gets to the point where we talk about them getting to the bottom of they can't seek therapy until they get as far down that you know the wife has left they've lost the last job they're homeless all those things um, that's a very different process than what you're describing right and, and for audience people uh, <laughs> who have family members like that um, they need to understand that those family members have a very severe illness and it's not the family member's fault that the person has it and hounding them to get help isn't going to make any difference maybe simply leaving will sometimes if you you got to play tough love but you, you can't just be constantly on their case because they're drunk and um, because that won't do any good I'll just make them take another drink well, well let's talk more about the type of drink because they I don't know whether that's more common, but it's certainly a more devastating problem. I, I, I live alone, and of course it affects friends, but I sort of structure my life. My friends know that yeah. after I, I lost, I started a gay and lesbian newspaper here, and incidentally, Kat, Justin out there, I now realize that you guys were right and I was totally wrong on that. So, but I live alone, and, mm -hmm. and since, yeah. since I lost that paper, everything I do in terms of like social activism, I try to think ahead, mm -hmm. plan ahead, so that, for instance, this television show, it's on weekly, but we don't have to do it weekly. Mm -hmm. So I can go through that two-week thing, the Katie Dickinson show was the last one, they do reruns in mm -hmm. between, they get that shows ahead, and it looks like I'm, you know, yeah. together. Well, and, and there are a lot of chronic alcoholics that fake it very well for a long time. There are physicians who uh, practice for years and go home every night and get plastered. And eventually it gets found out because other <coughs> physicians are trained to be observant and you start noticing signs and uh, people, though, that, that are in less, less public positions uh, can often go for years without anybody ever finally labeling them alcoholic and then they go through years of denial don't want to 
admit that they're alcoholics. They don't have a problem drinking. They do just fine. And sometimes it's many, many, many years before those folks hit the bottom and, and get help. Well, I was chronic for a long time. I mean, um, for years, just like that, yeah. every single day I drank. Um, I went through a long period here in town where I never missed a day of work but once. Yeah. I made homemade wine, and there was one day a year when I lost such control of it <laughs> that uh, I yeah. would miss work and go yeah. and say, I am just so far gone. Yeah. And I think for about four years I did that. And I think one of the things that addiction specialists have finally learned is that for, for true substance abusers, whether it's alcohol or other drugs, you have to see it as a disease without getting into discussion mm. about whether it's a biologic disease or not. Um, it's like treating diabetics. You know, we don't get mad at our diabetics when they come to the hospital in diabetic coma. We treat them and get them back stable and send mm -hmm. them out again. And, you know, for years, and I think that's why you, you get mixed feeling, mixed reactions from docs in the ER, because uh, if, if you work in an ER long enough, you see the same folks coming through over and over and over again. You know, you think, oh, God, here comes <coughs> Greg again. Yeah, well, you know, the, it's the hard to... Who, well, well, you yeah. know, and, and doing the yeah. show and, and, you know, being sober, let's say, most of the time, yeah. I've had people on the other side of this table who come and, you know, the guy who's the chaplain yeah. for hospice mm -hmm. stops in and talks to me and we have discussions yeah. about life and death and theology, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. You know, and I'm well, oh, hi, Greg, you don't remember me, but, yeah. you know, that's <laughs> yeah. uh, the last yeah. time you were in. Yeah. We wanted to talk about, and I want to get back to this yeah. thing of, of the system, the local. the local. Twice now, huge ambulances and, and teams of men came when it's called in and everybody knows I'm drunk. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. The first time with the with the tranquilizers, I can understand that. I don't know quite why you got the ambulance the second time. I uh, standard thing. Yeah. Yeah, Greg's ready. Call nine one one. Really? Make sure die every time yeah. it shows up. Your friends don't have cars to put you in. I have done that. I mean, there's no reason to take an ambulance. Well, that's you're drunk. true. You're, yeah. Assuming you can walk. Uh, um, at times, I've not been able yeah. to walk. Um, or maybe they think it's easier. I don't know. But yeah. that seems like yeah. that's a tremendous waste. It's a tremendous waste of resources. Yeah. Around, I mean, <laughs> Especially know. around here, when you call 911 <laughs> and you get the fire truck and the ambulance and the police car and. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can't just call an ambulance in Missoula. We sort of talked about this. Uh, I, I've worked at the Oxford for many years, and I've seen innumerable times where the whole shebang uh, and the guys back in 45 minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's been one of the issues that the Downtown Association has been struggling with, with the panhandlers and the aggressive behavior and things downtown, that uh, even if a, a harassed person calls for help, they haul them out to the jail, book them, and release them. Let's talk about a, a different kind of drunk alcohol. Yeah. Or let's talk about, let's say, a middle class housewife who calls her family and says, I, I'm having horrible trouble. I'm ready to check yeah. myself in. Da, da, da. They don't even know she's got a problem. They have no experience with this. What are they liable to find out? Um. I can't tell you a whole lot about that locally. Providence Center has an excellent detox program up on the top floor of the, mm -hmm. the facility there, there. Um, which middle class housewives are certainly eligible for. Um, I don't know whether it's full all the time or not. I, I don't think it is. I, I would <coughs> think that if that woman pulled into St. Pat's ER, that the ER doc would just push all the buttons to get them admitted over there, I, but I don't know. Well, what happened in this particular case, I'm talking about, you know, she came from quite a distance, and so she was sober enough, they mm -hmm. said, yeah, sleep it off, come talk to us in the morning, and get a counselor. She got a counselor, said, yeah, we'll, ch we'll check in if you want yeah. to, but we don't have any place available. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I think most middle, upper class folks, um, deal with these things through their private physician. As I would say that you probably should, if, if your physician knows that you have an alcohol problem, when you are trying to sober up, 
I would think that it would not be unreasonable to ask him for four days' worth of benzodiazepines to help you with it. Um, and I used to do that all the time when I was in practice. Uh, and, and most uh, your middle, ho middle class housewife that you were talking about, I would anticipate would call, or the family would call the internist, and the internist would arrange for them to be admitted somewhere. Uh, most people prefer to be admitted a little ways out of town. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are other facilities uh, you go over towards Washington and down in Idaho. Yeah, I went to Galen in the old days to, to dry mm -hmm. out. That was the first place I went. Boy, I thought that was efficiently done. We used to do it wonderfully. <coughs> I was an intern in a little county hospital in, in the middle of the Central Valley in California. And we detox people right and left. And, then, and they'd stay for three or four days, and then they'd be gone again. And, uh, uh, we didn't do much for them. I mean, we, mm. we helped them dry out. And, they got to talk to the social worker and talk about what they were going to do with their life. Well, Galen, in the old days, uh, you'd go to the emergency room, or they'd be taking you in there. Um, there'd be none of this emergency room rigmarole. Mm -hmm. They'd come out and say, yeah, you're, you're drunk. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You sit over there in this room, uh, and someone would come. They give you a bus ticket, they take you down, put you on the mm. bus. Really? <laughs> yeah. And uh, you'd get up, you'd be dropped at the gates of Galen. Uh -huh. Wander up to, <laughs> to the building. That's interesting. <clears throat> they would admit you. Or I mean you'd walk wander in. They yeah. they take But you're uh, talking about a motivated drunk. Somebody who's willing to sit on the bus in the first place. Well there's uh, that too. I mean But uh, that class, that motivated drunk yeah. doesn't have a place to go anymore. Yeah. You know, That's it, true. I mean, for instance, that morning that I'm talking about when I really was desperate for help, I would have gone to Galen. Yeah. Um, when Galen was closed during the Reagan years, because that sort of thing was considered way too expensive yeah. for us to handle, um, I went to Butte. And in that case, same thing. Little room, that same pass. Mm -hmm. Somebody from AA came. Right. Uh, they drove me over there. They still do that years. sometimes. Um, well, maybe I'm doing yeah. Um, so what what could we do better? I guess. Or what needs improvement? Yeah. I guess. I don't know. I would like to see a program like ShareHouse only for non-homeless people. I mean, ShareHouse is wonderful. They do some just really <coughs> incredible place. But um, you got to be homeless to get in, and that certainly does not meet uh, the needs <coughs> of non-homeless. Um, Probably more education of healthcare providers, uh, social workers, the kinds of people that you would encounter in these processes you know, uh, of uh, the options. I suspect there are more options out there than any of us know about. If uh, if, if we knew, you know. Well, you know, I thought for, I was going to call for a big campaign here. Maybe as we yeah. talk, maybe we, that isn't what's needed. But it seems to me that when this happens, somehow there should be some easier way of doing this. That it shouldn't be dropped on brand. I don't know exactly. Yeah. Well, I don't know answer, answers either. In my opinion, and it's strictly my opinion, um, if somebody genuinely wants to get sober, they should have a chance to do that with a little bit of help. Okay, uh, that's what. How much help they need, I don't know. I'm a big believer in AA. I mean, I really think that that's, for most alcoholics, that's where the help is. <coughs> um, AA is not terribly excited about medication help during detox. They tend to want you to tough it out and keep coming to meetings, and they'll let you throw up at the meeting. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, although I don't think they have any objections to it medical detox but I have been in meetings of, of a group where people have shown up drunk and nobody knew what to do with it. That's unusual. Most well, AA groups are pretty maybe, handy with it. I'm not even saying it's yeah. AA. I'm oh, just saying yeah. that uh, that this yeah. has happened where yeah. some of these groups are for people who are sober uh -huh. who want to stay sober yeah. and they're not equipped to deal with mm -hmm. people until they Mm -hmm. or, or 
they are and they aren't, and you know, mm -hmm. I, I really shouldn't say. Yeah. But most AA groups know how to deal with that. And they welcome them in and tell them that they're more than welcome to stay as long as they're not disruptive, and they sit there and drink their coffee. Well, it seems like maybe the problem isn't the biggest. Well, I think probably, as always, one needs to need some numbers and some documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, uh, I'm on the, the board of Coverell Center, and a tremendous percentage of our clients have histories of drinking problems. Uh, again, we're talking about homeless people. Um, and they come in, and, and as long as they are not drunk, they're welcome. So we have a lot of people who are two or three days into being sober. We deal with it. No, it's not. Uh, we got a good staff, and uh, um, as far as whether there needs to be a place or a, a program, um, <coughs> part, part of the problem is not just alcohol-related. It has to do with the whole mental health system. Uh, I, I always say that as a society we have prioritized corrections um, and military efforts over mental health and education, you know, things that would make a difference in the lives of, of the folks that you and I work with. Um, if, if the way that as a society we're going to deal with drunks is to put them in jail, We've got a pretty nice facility. I mean, we just spent $17 million to, to build it out there. Um, if the way we're going to treat them is to turn them out on the streets, and I think that's sort of where society's decision is, uh, you know, so by and large, people want to see substance abuse as a personal choice. Yeah. And until you can educate people that true alcoholics, are not making a, this is not a personal choice. Just like you don't choose to be gay, you may be comfortable being gay, but you'd probably yeah. just as soon not have been born that way. True alcoholics, once they're exposed to alcohol, um, they're not choosing to drink. Um, some of them can choose not to drink. If, if, if they're in a quality AA kind of ongoing program and they've got the community support. And they, I mean, it takes a lot to not drink if you're an alcoholic. And, and so I, th I see a tremendous education component there. Uh, as far as what you do with them when they need to detox, I don't know. As I say, I think you, if, if every alcoholic had a good physician, they'd have 50% of the battle won. When you go to the ER, if you have a doc and you call your physician ahead of time and tell them what's going on, you'll get different treatment in the ER than you will if you just roll through and say, I need help. Um, should, I should say that once you start, once you decide you're going to quit, you get weaker and more demoralized than when you were drinking. Or it seems oh, to me. absolutely. It's why you were drinking. That's like, I can't, you know, for me to get up and say, go to see my doctor. Mm -hmm. becomes, right. You know. I suppose I could tell you yeah, and maybe make it the door. Of course, the that problem is that you can't get an appointment to see your doctor. <coughs> if, I mean, yeah. most, most people, it takes me a week or two unless I really am sick uh, to, get, to get in to see my doc, and she's very responsive, and there are a lot of other docs that are harder than that. So, so that doesn't help a whole lot if it's right now. But I think if you're honest with your physician and you say, I have a drinking problem, and I might call you and ask for help, uh, you know, it, it should be six hours away instead of... The irony is that the uh, tranquilizers that Frank was so worried about are the ones that would have helped me right. get through. Yeah. But, uh, and in small doses, they're not toxic. So <coughs> it, it's possible to give a person two or three days worth um, without any problems, especially the long-acting ones we use now. You know, I cannot see how we're doing on time. I don't and I had the kind of show where I didn't mm -hmm. say I can't see I'm, how we're I don't need to I've moved into a new phase of my life. My watch broke. I and I'm that. trying to learn to live without it. So I don't have a clue what time it is. Should we say anything else before I wind this up? I, this is our I chance. don't have anything. This is our chance. <laughs> I'm not going to... I don't do this often. I'm not gonna do it. 
I want to do yeah. this show again. Yeah. Well, one of the things that bothers me, um, despite being a big advocate of AA, is that most AA groups tend to be apolitical and non-evangelizing. And, uh, in fact, I've had some, some wonderful heated arguments with uh, big-time AA people over this, because it seems to me if somebody is feeling like they have had too much to drink, or they're tired of drinking, mm -hmm. they want to quit drinking, and they, they look in the paper and there's, there's an AA group every day and most days have two or three of them mm -hmm. in town, so it's not a problem to find one. And you go and they meet you and, you know, they take your name and address. But they don't follow up. And it seems to me that that, that person, they don't, have, they don't <coughs> have to aggressively follow up, but just a phone call to see if they're coming to the next meeting. You know, would, would you like a ride? Uh, you know, some little little outreach. And then the political aspects of it. I mean, if, if you've been sober for six years, let's say, I think it would be awfully nice to, to do a program like this or to, uh, to somehow communicate that it is possible to get sober and how much better life is when you're sober and how your new wife is, I mean, whatever wonderful things are happening. Uh, and, and to talk about what's known about addiction now because we know so much more than we used to. And there are, there are all kinds of ways to, to help. And there are drugs that people can take to keep them from drinking, which work we reasonably there's, well. There's, this uh, is a huge yeah, I mean, it's just, but it's but of. so much of that is it, it's almost like uh, it's un, you know it's under the t it's one of those hush hushy things we're not supposed to talk about that and I think we really we don't have any trouble. American Diabetic Association's got ads on television talking about diabetes mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, the rheumatoid arthritis people, but did, how much do you see about alcoholism as as a disease? You don't. And, and I think hey, do it's hey, hey, I'm surprised that yeah. they don't ask TV ads now. Not locally, but nationally. Nationally? That's, I haven't seen on what television, but yeah. I haven't. Uh, but I think I it's very important. Right? Our last chance before. Go ahead. I, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to thank a few people for getting me through this. I have three friends who stand out above all the rest. I even want to mention their names. Dan Moorhead, Brant Good, Joel Baird. Those three people. I don't... I told you this is what yeah, we're saving this for the yeah. end. These three people just are invaluable to me. Not for alcohol, it's for everything in my life. They are tremendous. I have a, an older gentleman, a Dick, who helps me, uh, or tries to help me with... Uh, alcohol problems. And then I want to thank a young man who has helped me on all these shows. I wish he could have been here today. Unfortunately, he couldn't. That's Ed Morrissey, who this show would never have happened and we would have never got this far with conversations if it hadn't been for him. And then I could start, it's like the Oscars, <laughs> I could yeah. start down. My minister this afternoon said, tell truth. Um, on and on, I go down. I, I, when people talk about drunk and homeless and friendless, and that may be true for a lot of people, but for me, yeah. I... Yeah, you don't have that excuse. Oh, God, I have. Yeah. I am more loved than I deserve. God, I just kind of tremendous people in my life, including you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, right now. <laughs> Thanks, Liz, for coming. You're welcome. That's really